Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today, the Angel of Death. Auschwitz was one of the most notorious and horrible of the concentration camps that existed during World War II. Over a million innocent people were murdered at the camp, which was located in southern Poland, which was annexed by Nazi German forces at the beginning of the war. Many survivors, of which there were only about 200,000 of the 1.3 million that were sent there, reported that when it came time to be paraded up the long ramp and inspected, there was often one SS official who would stand off to the side. He would gesture to the soldiers giving his decision about which people would be placed in work camps and which ones would be sent to their death. The survivors came to call this man the Angel of Death due to his direct connection to theirs and their loved ones' fates. But the real name of this man was Josef Mengele. Mengele grew up wealthy in Gunzburg, Germany. His father, Karl Mengele, fought in World War I while his mother took over the family threshing production business. When the war ended, the company, simply named Karl Mengele, took full advantage of a peacetime hike in production and became the third largest company of its kind in Germany. According to Gerald Posner's book, Mengele, The Complete Story, the factory became Gunzberg's largest employer and the Mengele's became the town's wealthiest family. As the oldest son, he was expected to take over the family's factory. This was not what Josef desired due to his own ambition and, according to several biographers, his distaste of his parents coldness. Instead, in 1930, at the age of 19, he traveled to Munich to attend the university there in order to study medicine. By 1930, the Nazi party had become the second largest political party in Germany, and Hitler had begun his rise to power. In his autobiography, Mengele noted that as a university student, he was greatly persuaded by the National Socialist Movement. He states, In the long run, it was impossible to stand aside in these politically stirring times should our fatherland not succumb to the Marxist Bolshevik attack. This simple political concept became the decisive factor in my life. In the meantime, Karl Mengele had joined the Nazi party due to his belief, and as it turned out not wrongly, that it would be a profitable move for him and his company. Aligning with the soon-to-rise political power not only kept the Mengele family in business, but it also allowed them to prosper. As for Yosef, he had a real interest in genetics and evolution, and since he was where he was, he studied under professors who subscribed to the life unworthy of life theory, or more simply known as Nazi eugenics. Eugenics in general was actually extremely popular at the world at this time, even supported by the likes of Winston Churchill. Further, by 1936 in the United States, 31 of 48 states had some type of eugenics or forced sterilization laws for undesirables. We're actually going to be talking about this a bit in an upcoming video which is called The Fascinating History of Eugenics. Okay, as for the Nazis, well, their particular brand of eugenics stemmed from the belief that the German and Aryan race was the master race and those who threatened to weaken it must be sterilized or simply killed. As one can imagine, this encompassed many groups of people, those of Jewish origin, anyone with a physical deformity, even being deaf, gypsies, homosexuals, people of African origin, etc. In fact, one of many Hitler's teachers was Ernst Rudin, the man behind Hitler's compulsory sterilization laws that were enacted in 1933. Fully immersed in this idea and in his studies, Mengele received his PhD in anthropology while also studying to be a doctor with his thesis Racial Morphological Research on the Lower Jaw Section of Four Racial Groups. This basically concluded that it was possible to identify races based solely on jawlines. He worked his first job at a hospital, and then in 1937 he was hired as a research assistant at Third Reich Institute for Hereditary, Biological and Racial Purity at the University of Frankfurt. He was taken under the wing of Ottmar Freiherr von Verscher, who took interest in twin research and said that Hitler was the first statesman to recognize hereditary, biological and race hygiene. Mengele quickly became Verscher's protege and was officially made part of the Nazi party in 1937 and the SS in 1938. With war on the Rise, and Mengele went to basic training and was eventually assigned to a regiment as a medic. He fought for the Third Reich in the early years of the war, even continuing his medical work with a paper about hereditary links found in ear fistules. He also found time to marry Irene Schonbein, though first as a requirement for being a member of the SS, he had to make sure she was of pure blood. 
Though it could not be determined if her great-grandfather's mother had any Jewish blood, she was given the OK due to friends saying that she was Nordic in her ways. In 1942, Virtua got Mengele placed out of harm's way and into the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology, Human Genetics, and Eugenics. There, Virtua and Mengele continued their work together. In 1943, with Virtua's blessing, he applied for work at Auschwitz in order to take advantage of the prisoners there. He was accepted, and thus began Mengele's most notorious work. Mengele arrived at Auschwitz when it housed nearly 140,000 prisoners. It was an enormous complex that, if it wasn't designed to commit unspeakable horrors, could have been admired for its organization. It had several libraries, its very own soccer stadium, theaters, swimming pools, and even a brothel. Mengele quickly took advantage of his new position when the camp was in the middle of a typhoid epidemic. Instead of treating it, he sent thousands of people stricken with the disease to the gas chamber. Mengele, like his mentor, took great interest in the medical attributes of twins, especially children. He would routinely separate twins, sometimes killing one to see if the other would sense it. He would study the differences and similarities between the two, often the eyes. In order to do this, though, he would gouge out the eyes, among many similar appalling experiments. As the war dragged on, his work expanded beyond twins to others. As mentioned, he and several guards would stand at the top of the ramp while trains unloaded, pointing and shoving people in one direction or another, nearly solely at Mengele's discretion. As described in a 1992 report, seven years in the making, prepared by the United States' Office of Special Investigations and presented to the Attorney General, in a grotesque perversion of the physician's role, Auschwitz's so-called angel of death employed his knowledge of the workings of life in order to destroy it. The report goes on to describe his apparent complete lack of remorse for anything he did and the continuous heinous acts that Mengele committed. If you're interested in reading more, we're linking to the full 197-page report in the description below. The Soviet armed forces captured Auschwitz on January 27, 1945, but Mengele had already fled by then. He traveled around German-occupied territories, evading Soviet and American forces, while carrying with him several boxes of medical records. He worked as a farmhand until he went to Genoa in 1949, and then, a few months later, he took sanctuary in Argentina. His wife, Irene, refused to go with him, and they divorced. He chose Argentina, like so many of his Nazi colleagues, because the government was firmly pro-Axis, thanks to President Juan Domingo Perón's fascist administration. With open arms, Perón accepted Nazi fugitives, not just for ideological reasons, but financial as well. Many of these escapees brought wealth with them that they'd looted from former prisoners. Argentina is where Mengele lived the next five years of his life, mostly under a false name, working as a small pharmaceutical business owner and a farmer. After an incident where a girl he tried to perform an abortion on died, he left for Paraguay. In May of 1960, the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency whose job was to track down Nazi war criminals and bring them to Israel for trial, captured Adolf Eichmann. After capturing Eichmann, they turned their attentions to Mengele. During the Nuremberg trials in 1945 and 1946, Mengele's name was mentioned several times, but Allied forces thought that he was dead. The Mossad, though, they knew otherwise. Indeed, they had found Mossad living in Sao Paulo in Brazil in 1962. But due to budgetary concerns and the ongoing dispute with Egypt, the Mossad was called back home and could not pursue him. Joseph Mengele went on to live another 17 years in relative seclusion and deteriorating health. There were recent journal entries showing that he had never changed his political ideologies or showed any remorse for his actions. He had a stroke in 1976 and died in 1979. He was buried under the false name of Wolfgang Gerhard in Brazil. It wasn't until 1992 that the authorities exhumed the body and DNA proved that Wolfgang was, in fact, Joseph Mengele, Auschwitz's angel of death. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do hit that subscribe button below. We put out brand new videos every day of the week. Also, let me thank our patrons on Patreon. If you are interested in supporting this show and helping us keep making these daily videos, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. We have some great perks lined up for people who do support us, so please check that out at patreon.com forward slash today I found out, or check the link in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.